Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to welcome you back to the program again today and thank you for joining us and uh, for tuning in every week at the same time. We are on several networks, so uh, when you write to us, let us know. If you're watching us, uh, take a moment to just go and send an email at info at and tell us where you're watching from, because as our contracts come up for renewal, we want to be good stewards of where uh, we are being watched and received from the most. And if you want to see us stay on the station that you are watching us on, please go to our website at info at and let us know if you're being blessed by the program where you're watching us from and what network you are watching. Uh, it really helps us. While you're there, become a partner with us. If you can't do that, that's still all right. I just, but if you're able to sow something into the ministry to help us to continue the ministry of television, uh, you can probably guess it's pretty expensive to do it. But uh, the Lord has been faithful to us. We've been on now for six years on national television, and the Lord has been faithful to us. And we are, and so have the people of God. Let me just say that. Thank you to our partners because it is you that help us take the gospel of the kingdom around the world. Uh, uh, now, you might be watching this in a motel room, or you may be watching this at your friend's house, and you say, well, I, is it on in my uh, area? Well, uh, the only way I can tell you is go check your local listings. There is a l whole list of channels that we are on on my website at lenhiles.com, and of course, that's on the screen right there. It'll tell you what channels we are on, and uh, you could go there. But if you cannot get those channels, and you have internet, you can watch us on YouTube. And YouTube, uh, you can go to my website again, and there's a link directly from the website to our YouTube channel, and subscribe to that channel, and you will get an email every time we upload a brand new program. And what's really cool about YouTube is that you can watch it on demand, you can share it on your Facebook page, you can, uh, you know, you can uh, uh, watch it anywhere in the world, and even the closed captioning on our program there translates in every language around the world, so you can share it with your friends. Also, you can listen to us on our iTunes uh, a podcast by simply going to iTunes and put my name in the search engine, and it will come up with our podcast. There's also an RSS feed for Android devices. So there's a lot of ways to watch it. Tune in and listen or watch, and I believe you'll be blessed by the Word of God that we're sharing. Last week, I talked some things about the covenant. I'm going to plug back in again uh, today and, and just read the, the verse. I really thought I'd get much further than this last week. But I want to go uh, back again to Matthew, the eighth chapter. We're going to try to uh, deal with the eighth chapter of Matthew in these segments. But it, it, it starts out by saying, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Behold, there came a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt... Thou canst make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, and saying, I will be thou clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See that thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. I, I'm going to stop there for a moment again, because I want to come back and talk about Jesus dealing with this leper. I think one of the things that could be said here even concerning this leper is that lepers were somebody that nobody else wanted to touch. And that might be what he's setting the stage to say throughout this whole chapter, because he's going to deal with the fact that uh, he's going to touch uh, he's going to touch the servant of a centurion. Uh, that he's going to touch a, uh, a, 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 a somebody that's from a different, uh, if you will, ethnic background that does not look like they are part of the covenant of promise as of yet, because God was going to offer it also to the Gentiles. But the thing I want you to see is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, but they are still under the Old Covenant, and Jesus is introducing what the kingdom looks like as He begins to ease the suffering of the human condition. One of the key things that I said last week was, this man comes to Jesus, this leper, he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. If you want to, you can make me clean. And Jesus' response immediately was, I will, I want to be made whole. And I, I think that's one of the things that we, first of all, get a, get a, get a, we have to get across 
in the thinking of the minds of God's people is God wants to heal us. God wants to bless us. God wants to give us the kingdom. And that's his desire is to cleanse the leper, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to, and, and, and that's so many levels. That's spiritual and natural healing. I mean, I think when you think about leprosy, it's a picture type of sin. Jesus wants to change our lives by healing not only the disease, but the very cause of it. The thing I want to say, though, again, in this segment, because I want to come back and talk still a little bit more about covenant. This is really in my heart in this season. Last week, I shared with you how God brought the children of Israel. There was five major covenants, at least five major ones. There was the covenant of Noah, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. Now, there are some other covenants in there uh, that, that are covenants, but these are the five major uh, covenants. God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt based on his promise to Abraham that I'm going to give you a seed and I'm going to bring it back into this land and it's going to be a, a seed that uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to, after 400, he, say, he tell, tells him that it's, it's going to go into Egypt and after several hundred years, God's going to visit them again. He's going to bring them back up out of that land and into the land that God had promised to Abraham. God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt, and some of them really aren't even wanting to go. But God does it not based on what you want as much as he does. He's got the back of this covenant partner by the name of Abraham. Dr. Weldon and I discussed this somewhat back uh, uh, probably about eight weeks ago on the program, but we were talking about how, uh, you know, if God is your covenant partner, man, if God's got your back, here's a, God uh, saying to Abraham, and, and you know, what you need to understand is there's stuff that happens in the Bible that it's kind of hard to figure out why it's happening if you don't understand it through the lens of covenant. In other words, God doesn't change. He's God, he changes not, but he's a covenant-keeping God. In other words, he will honor his word above his name. And if he's, got, if he's your covenant partner, he's got your back. And here's Abraham, literally, even before the law comes on the scene. So there's no commandments. There's no rules. There's just God saying to Abraham in a grant covenant, a one-sided covenant, which is I'm in blessing, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to multiply your seed, make it like the sand of the stars, like the sand of the seashore, like the stars of the heaven. I'm going to make your name great. In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And he given Abraham all of these promises. He becomes Abraham's covenant partner. And when, Ab when, when Abraham cut the pieces of an animal in half and the blood began to run and they were going to make this blood covenant, the Bible said that God appeared and walked through that blood and the appearance was like a smoking torch and a burning flax. And God stood in that blood and made promise to Abraham saying, and blessing, I'm going to bless you. And you can go back and look at all the tenets of the Abrahamic covenant. But when Abraham would have got back up and walked through that covenant site to make his promise as what he was going to do for God on the terms of this covenant, God caused a deep sleep to fall on Abraham. I love that. Because what he's simply saying is God can do more while you rest than he can do while you're trying to do something. I used to have a, a tease that came on when our program used to come on. It used to say, if, if you work, God will rest. And if you rest, God will work. But in this position of rest, God caused a deep sleep to fall on Abraham. And Abraham, while he was in a deep sleep, God walked back through that blood saying to him, literally, I'm going to keep both sides of this covenant. I'm going to, in other words, God is swearing by himself to Abraham. I'm your covenant partner. I'm your exceeding great reward. This is what's going to happen. I'm your covenant partner. Now that is a good deal. The only thing God asked of Abraham is that you believe. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. You see Abraham do things. As a matter of fact, the two times, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. But Abraham, the two times he is probably enriched more than any other time in his life is the two times he lies about his wife, Sarah. Now, it must be pretty 
It must be pretty wild to have a wife that is so good looking that every time you turn around, you've got to lie about her and tell the king or whoever it is that's after her that that's your sister. And the last one, I believe it was Abimelech, she was 80 some years old. Now that's an, that must be, if, if his wife was that good looking at 80 some years old that he had to lie about her, there must be something about this covenant God made with Abraham that was keeping them young. Because, of course, you know the story of how uh, Abraham is 100, Sarah is 86 when she has this son. But nevertheless, you know, these, these kings are going to take Sarah. They've taken them into their harem. And, man, before they can uh, sleep with her, God shows up because he's Abraham's covenant partner. And here's Abraham who just lied about her, said, tell him you're my sister. And man, you know, he goes in and, and, and taps the king on the shoulder and says, hey, buddy, if you touch her, I'm going to kill you. And so he, listen, God was literally Abraham's covenant partner. And the king, man, the, when the king realizes, hey, this woman is this man's wife, he comes back and tells Abraham, hey, dude, listen, man, you should have told me she was your wife, man. God was going to kill me over this situation. You should have at least told me that she's your wife. And these kings gave him a bunch of money and sent him away. Abraham literally got rich in those situations. You say, why did he get by with that? It's because there was not a commandment yet. You see, uh, you see Moses get by with killing an Egyptian in the desert. Why? Because the commandment had not yet been given and where there is no law, there is no transgression, the book of Romans says. So there was, they did not transgress the law of Moses because it was not yet given. That did not occur until Exodus, the 19th chapter. But the covenant that God made with Abraham was a grant covenant. It was a one-sided covenant, and God kept Abraham's back and was his covenant partner. See, the new covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, is carried all the way through into the new covenant, where, if you will, uh, I like how uh, uh, Dr. Weldon explained that a little bit. It's like a train moving forward all through the Scripture, and it comes all of a sudden up to Jesus, and then that covenant finds its fulfillment in Jesus because Galatians 4 says that the law was added as an addendum until the seed, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Jesus came to deliver the promise. He was the seed that God told Abraham was coming. He is the fulfillment of those promises. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. It was not seeds as of many, but one seed, and to thy seed which is Christ. And so all of the Abrahamic covenant, if you will, was unloaded on Christ because he could carry, can use to carry the promise <coughs> and include us in that promise. He swallowed it up in himself and so that he was the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise, delivering a people and a seed that would be a blessing to the nations. You are blessed to be a blessing, and then that seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. The only thing that's blessed the entire earth is not the natural seed. It was the seed, which is Christ, that has been a blessing to all the nations of the earth. But God visits then the children of Israel based on the Abrahamic covenant. And when he comes up out of the land of Egypt, they come to the foot of Mount Sinai, and they've done all kinds of stuff. They've murmured, they've complained, they've done all kinds of stuff, even in just that short amount of time coming out of Egypt in, into the wilderness, and there's not any judgment. The reason there's no judgment or wrath is because the Scripture tells us that the law works wrath. And so there was no law yet. So you see them, they, I mean, they murmur, complain, but it's not until after God gives them the law at Mount Sinai that you see the wrath of God begin to come. But what I want you to see, I'm going to go over there because I think it's important for us to kind of reiterate this. To me, this is one of the most powerful, uh, powerful things that you can see concerning the Mosaic Covenant. This really helped me seeing God through the eyes of covenant. Why did God do some stuff that he did? And it seems like God, you know, is a completely God, different God when you read the Old Testament than he is when you see Jesus because Jesus is the express image and the person of the Father, and he manifests him to us. If you go back uh, into the book of Exodus, I'm sure here I'm, I'm having a little difficulty getting my iPad to work that fast, but Exodus, the 19th chapter, it says, In the third month, when the children of Israel were going forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. 
Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. God is doing this on the basis of his promise to Abraham. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant. Which covenant? The covenant he made with Abraham. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me a, a, above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. I could see God probably excited for the first time in history. He's going to begin to have a people that he can literally dwell among and have personal relationship with them. You know, I think about sometimes... We preach a lot about what we lost in the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden, but we never think about what God lost. What God lost was intimate relationship with a family of sons, a royal family in the earth, a, if you will, a nation of priests that he can walk with, he can talk with, he can share his heart with. And what I think is incredible is God is offering that to these people when they come out of Egypt. I can see God almost excited saying, listen, for the first time, I'm going to have a whole nation of priests, a family. I, I want to have personal relationship with these people. And uh, he brings them out, and he's bringing them out based on the covenant he made with Abraham. Abraham, the scripture said, was the friend of God. God is looking for your friendship. He's not just looking for a bunch of servants. We must lose our slave orphan mentality and get a sonship mentality. He said, I want to make a kingdom of priests. I want to make a whole nation, a whole nation. These are the words. And I believe God would have used the nation of Israel just like he wanted to use Adam in the garden. He wanted to take, use Adam in the garden as his vice regent to export everything that was in that garden. In other words, he was to take heaven's influence and fill the earth to multiply, replenish, and reproduce. And I believe what God was going to do with the nation of Israel was use them as a first fruits, if you will, to touch the nations of the earth. And of course, it's through that natural seed that Christ came, but the seeds were not plural, thy seed, which is Christ. And God did bless the nations of the earth through uh, the seed of Abraham. But the thing that I'm after is that I believe that God would have used them to touch the nations of the earth. Now, we find later in the New Testament, God comes clear back full circle because these people in just a few verses are about to forfeit a personal relationship with God for a mediator system. Now, I'll show that to you in a minute. But, and, and so they forfeit that and God moves from this Abrahamic covenant and he gives them the Mosaic covenant. Now, the Mosaic Covenant was not a covenant like Abraham. Abraham had a grant covenant. It was one-sided. God said, here's the deal. I'm going to bless you. All you got to do is believe me. In the Mosaic Covenant, it becomes two-sided. I will do this if you do that, and here's some blessings, and here's some cur cursings, and here's the terms of the covenant. But here's what happened. First of all, I want you to see that this is the setting. God brought them across the Red Sea. He says to them, here's my heart. I want to make a whole nation of priests. I want to have personal relationship with you. But the moment we forfeit a personal relationship with God for a mediator system, the more you are out of relationship with God, the more rules you will need. The rules were given because the people didn't have a relationship. In the new covenant, God wants to bring us back into relationship where we don't need a bunch of rules. See, the less we have relationship with, and see, I'm, I'm, the, the thing that so concerns me is most of the American church, their Sunday morning appearance in church is basically this thought. Give me the basic rules of what it takes for me to get to heaven when I die, and let me pay my fire insurance, and you tell me what God says, and we'll do it. But nobody wants to develop a personal relationship with God, but God is so hungry to have a personal relationship with you. And he wants you to have, listen, he wants you to live not out of a bunch of rules, but out of a relationship. As you see the story unfold, it says that after God, that's what he offered. And Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. 
he, and the Lord, the people said, we will do it. And, and uh, God, God, our Moses tells the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, go up unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai, and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mountain, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet sounded long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the people of the, uh, when the, when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And the, let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the, the Lord break forth upon them. Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you charged us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain, sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests of the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest they break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. Now if you go over quickly to chapter Chapter 20, God, after God gives them the Ten Commandments in the first several verses, here's what the people said to Moses in verse 19. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your eyes that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto God. Under the thick darkness where God was, and the Lord said unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. And he begins to speak to them. Now let me give you one other thing. I think it's in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Let me see if I can find it really quick. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he is re, uh, reiterating the commandments again. Thou shalt not kill, honor the Sabbath day, keep it holy. But he gives us something in Deuteronomy 5 that we don't see in Exodus 19. But this is the backstory. This is why that they shifted from a grant covenant under Abraham to a, if you will, a kinsman covenant, uh, covenant under Moses, which was a two-sided covenant. God wanted to have personal relationship with these people, but they forfeited for a mediator system. But this is what they said, verse 23, And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness... For the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God does talk with man, and he lives. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more than we will die. Who, for who is there of all flesh that heard the voice of the living God out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Go thou near and hear all that the Lord God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words. He heard you speak when you said unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Go say to them, get you to your tents again. For But as for you, stand here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and statutes and judgments which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I shall give you to possess. God was offering them a personal relationship. But here's the back story. Deuteronomy 5, when they, God comes down on this mountain to offer them this covenant and this relationship, the people saw God and they said, listen, we're afraid of him, Moses. You go talk to him. That's what's happening here in Deuteronomy 5. That's the back story. We're afraid. You go talk to him, and whatever he tells you, we will do it. And the people forfeited a personal relationship with God for a mediator system. 
but they forfeited it. They could have had a personal relationship with God, and God said, all right, you tell the people, I heard what they said. Go back to their tents. Now you get Aaron and his sons, and you bring them up here, and God created a priesthood that would be the mediator system. But that was not the heart of God to start out with. When we come over into the New Covenant, Peter grabs a hold of that and said, you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. God brings us back into a personal relationship and the priesthood of the believer. And he brings them right back into a place where, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he tells them, you can have access to this. And he said, I'm going to, in the, new, in, the, in the book of Hebrews, I'm trying to rush because I'm about to run out of time. But in the book of Hebrews, he says, you know, uh, for, well, here in Deuteronomy, he tells them, you teach them the law. You teach them the statutes, you teach them the commandments. But in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says you won't need any man to teach you, but the Holy Spirit will be your teacher. In other words, God wanted to bring this back to a personal relationship. What the people did was per forfeited a personal relationship with God for a mediator system. And then God, literally, because he gave these commands, he said, if you do this, this is what will happen. If you don't, here's the curses. And every time God would give one of the curses, the people would say amen to the curses. I mean, after you read it in Deuteronomy 27, 28, 29, and every time God would give a curse, the people would say amen. After God gave the blessings, not one time did the people ever say and amen. Here's the good news in Revelation chapter 2, I believe it is, or chapter 3, Jesus says, I am the amen. I'm the faithful and true witness. I'm the beginning of the creation of God. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm the final amen to all the curses. I took all the curses on myself. I took them to the tree. Curses is he that hangs on a tree so that I could become the beginning of the creation of God where it's no longer about cursing. It's about blessing for in Christ all of God's promises are yes and somebody ought to say amen to that. I think it is incredible that Malachi says the last few words of Malachi, I will come and smite the earth with a curse. But the last few words of the book of Revelation is grace be unto you. Amen. Somebody finally says amen to the promise of God because there's a better covenant based on better promises, based on better blood, where God draws us back to himself, where we have access to him with personal relationship. And, and that personal relationship, we live out of relationship rather than live out of rules. This commandment and this covenant was added, Hebrews says, for 400 and some years as an addendum until the seed should come who could bring us right back to the promise. But once the promise has come, hallelujah, which is Christ, you and I don't live out of an old covenant any longer. We live in a new covenant. Wow, we're out of time. I am amazed that one went by so fast. But uh, tune in again next week at the same time. I'll probably pick back up here again and continue to talk about this. But if you'd like to sow a seed into the ministry and help us take the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace around the world, go to the website. You can give via credit card. You can call the number on the screen for the telephone. If you don't get an answer, uh, leave your number. If you want us to call you back, we will call you back. And uh, think about and consider becoming a partner with our ministry today. It is your faithful gifts that help us take the gospel around the world. And without you, it is impossible. Tell your friends about us and tune in again next week. The word repentance means to change your mind. The message of John the Baptist and of Jesus was to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is accessed by a change in our thinking. If you are in outer darkness, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That reality is not always out in the distant future. It is in people's lives right now. One simple mind shift can move you out of darkness and weeping and into light and rejoicing. God wants to wipe all tears from our eyes and replace our weeping with joy.